I'd like to welcome you to the second lecture in our lecture series at SOIS Berlin, What Social Science Research Tells Us or Told Us About Ukraine. My name is Gwendolyn Sasse. I'm the director of the Center for East European and International Studies in Berlin. SOIS is the German acronym. And this series we run in cooperation with Humboldt University in, in Berlin. And we thought that um, amidst Russia's war in Ukraine, it is necessary to take stock of what uh, social science has already, in fact, told us for a long time about Ukraine. And maybe um, it, it wasn't as widely received as it should have been. And also we want to look at what kind of social science research is possible now. And this brings me to a fantastic project that we will hear about in today's um, lecture or talk. And then there will be room for discussion and questions afterwards. And the project is called um, Data for Ukraine. And we will hear about um, machine learning and how it helps to detect um, uh, war crimes um, amidst uh, Russia's war in Ukraine. And I'm uh, really happy, if that's the right word under the circumstances, but I'm happy to see uh, Graham Robertson and Eric Wibbles, who are the masterminds behind this project. Uh, Graham Robertson is Professor of Political Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And there he's also the director of the Center for Slavic, Eurasian and East European Studies. And his academic work has for a long time focused um, on Eastern Europe, um, among other countries on, on Ukraine and Russia. He's focused on political protest, on regime support in different um, types of regimes. And he's also more recently worked on um, emotions in that context. Um, he has many publications in all the mainstream uh, and the best political science uh, journals. Um, he is, um, among other publications, uh, published a book with Cambridge University Press on the politics of protest in hybrid regimes. Um, and Eric Ribbles is, a, is the Robert Cohen Professor of Political Science and the co at um, Duke University and also the co-director of the Dev Lab at Duke. And uh, he has focused in his research on different aspects of development, on redistribution, and political geography has also been very widely published. Um, he has edited, uh, for example, a book with Cambridge University Press on decentralized governance and accountability, academic research and the future of donor programming. And I think the title highlights right away that Eric has a keen interest on linking um, research to something that is policy relevant. And he's also involved in a project, Machine Learning for Peace, and I think that already creates um, the link to the project we will hear about today, um, the um, attempt to use machine learning techniques um, and collect data, um, difficult data, um, amidst an ongoing war, which I think um, is already of great importance now and also shows what social science can do in terms of archiving and documenting um, uh, horrible things that are happening. And this will, I think, be an important resource also for scholars, for policymakers, and also for courts in the future. So I'm really happy um, that you will give us an insight into this project, which I know um, is coordinated and run by a larger team. Um, also scholars from and in Ukraine are part of this. But without further ado, I hand over to you. You have about 30 to 40 minutes to present the project and, and, and how um, you are also already maybe using some of the data it generates. And uh, just as a bit of information for everybody, this is a recorded webinar, so we'll only have questions in the chat, but you can uh, start writing comments or questions as you hear the talk, and I will try to um, make sure everything is asked and uh, read out or picked up afterwards in the discussion. So without further ado, Graham and Eric, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Gwen, for that really kind introduction. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be at Zeus again. Um, uh, this um, this project is is, is 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 very new and very uh, exciting and, and engaging for us, um, and so it's a wonderful opportunity to share it with with you. And, and as you'll see as we go through, um, it's a uh, it's a real time exercise you know, in, in lots of different ways. Um, it's a real time exercise in the sense that we're gathering real time data, um, but it's also real time in the sense that we're working out what it is we're doing and how we're doing it and, and, and in some sense of why we're doing it uh, on the hoof as we go. Um, and so we're really interested in any feedback and, and, and comments that, that, that people might have. Um, 
this is a if this is more of a of a big data than a machine learning project. The the machine learning title comes from from Eric's uh, larger uh, research project. But but what this really is is is, is a project about using big data uh, and specifically Twitter data to collect um, real time information on what's happening in, in, in Ukraine. The project was the brainchild of Eric uh, and along with Ernesto Calvo at the University of, of, of Maryland. Um, they talked to me about it. I, I found it super interesting and I, I put him in touch with, with Ola Ono, who's um, at the University of Manchester, who's one of the you know, really leading experts on, on Ukraine. and. Timothy Brick at the Kiev School of, of Economics and, and lots and lots of other people, uh, many graduate students and postdocs uh, who have uh, led many, many hours to this to this project, which um, I think you know, became much bigger than all of us expected pretty, pretty fast. Um, could you go to the next slide? Right, thanks. So the basic idea underlying this thing was to, you know, something that we all experienced at the beginning of the war, I think, was you know, this monstrous event was happening and trying to make sense of it uh, in real time and trying to understand what was going on and where and why and how and all of the different details and, and, and aspects of it was, was I think, you know, quite overwhelming uh, at first. The war was happening incredibly fast. It was changing really fast. It's happening over this incredibly wide area. Ukraine's a huge country, uh, as, as you all know. Um, there's lots of news coverage, but, you know, it comes necessarily with, with the delay um, and you know, none of us have time to read everything that that, that comes out of Ukraine um, uh, or is on Ukraine. Um, and so, how do we actually kind of get a sense of both the big picture of what's going on and the, and the, and, and, and some of the details? Um, and so, the idea emerged to use uh, Twitter data um, and in various different ways that we'll talk about uh, this morning. Uh, to try and see if we can get both a sense of the big picture and, and of some of the details in, in real time. And then as the project evolved, we became more and more aware of the, of the probability, unfortunately, sadly, that what we're also doing is creating an archive uh, of uh, potential war crimes um, that would be useful for people for uh, later uh, investigations. And so that's the sort of the basic setup of the, of the, of the project. Could you so 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 with that sort of basic setup, Eric will uh, explain what we're actually doing. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Graham, and, <clears throat> and thanks to all of you for for attending. And and um, so what I'd like to do is just walk briefly through some of the sort of more technical pieces of what we're what we're doing. And I'm going to do this in the form of a series of questions that we had to answer as we as we moved through the project. And the first one was really how you know where where can we get this data. You know, and as you've as you've probably seen from lots of other work out there these days, Twitter is one of those sources that is widely available. Um, you know, think what we might of a of a billion a new billionaire owner. Um, we found this to be the easiest, most open source of data, and so we we connected ourselves to the Twitter API using a bunch of accounts. Um, and you know, when we say real time, it's not quite real time. It's more like about an hour delay. Um, but there are a lot of really nice tools out there these days for for managing that data, and, and we're relying on Python and, a, and in particular uh, the Twerk two library to sort of organize all of this data. So then the question is, okay, we have all of Twitter out there in the world. That's an awful lot of tweeting that's going on. How do we how do we take that universe and turn it into something a little bit more tractable? And when you connect to the Twitter API, you're given a single term that you can use um, in order to search. So you necessarily want really, at least initially, you want very, very vague terms that can yield as much potentially relevant data as possible, which you can then trim down later. So we, we began with this set of terms here. <clears throat> we have you know, our, our ideas that we wanted to see what was going on in, in all three languages. And so these are, you know, these are these are very very vague terms. And the uh, our idea in constructing this list of terms, which we experimented with a bit, was to just get as much as we possibly can. So you get each day, um, at least at the beginning, we had five million tweets a day. These, you know, the sort of global attention is is on decline some, but we're still talking about an enormous amount of data, two million tweets a day. Um, and at this point, we have a database sitting back there um, of, of more than 200 million tweets. And one of the things that Graham and I might have some time to talk about towards the end is what, what one might do with this above and beyond the real-time detection that we're working on now. Um, so the first, the first question is, where can we get real-time data? We decide on Twitter. 
then the question is, okay, so now we have two or four or five million tweets a day. What what is actually relevant in that set of data? And that this is this is not a trivial consideration. This this took a fair bit of work. And so basically, with Team Onik and also with with some of Graham's help as well, um, we started with 400 core Twitter handles. And these are everything from um, independent journalists to local politicians to national politicians to NGOs involved in uh, in human rights to whatever. Um, and this sort of we then use these 400 to see who are they connected to, who is retweeting what they are tweeting, and who in turn are they retweeting. So the the this 400 core accounts we then look who they're connected to and who they're retweeting with. And this turns into a broader Twitter network of 3,732 Twitter handles. And this, this basically defines the network that we are, that we are looking at, okay? The, if, you, if you look at the share of the total tweets that are within this overall network, this is, what we, this is about what we have in, the, in, in the, the core network. Now, as we'll see, as this network connects to the rest of the world, the, the composition of um, language changes. So English becomes more important because there's a lot of consumption of the English language tweets that's going on. Um, so, okay, so let me, let me just, before I put up some confusing table. So once we have this 3000 and whatever Twitter set of Twitter handles, we can, we can take a very sort of detailed look at amongst all of these handles, what are the sub communities that are communicating with each other? i.e. where is there a high density of communication um, amongst different handles. And that allows you to, to slice up the, the broader community into what are essentially sub-communities. And all I wanna do here is emphasize that as you look at these sub-communities, there's a lot of differentiation in terms of the language. So for instance, community one, which is to say the largest network with the densest amounts of communication is one that has an awful lot of English language communication. And I'll show you who's in, who the most significant tweeters are in this community in just a minute. But you go to community two, and I'll also show you the, this sort of a little bit about the composition of this community in a second. This community is, is, um, is tweeting and retweeting in a lot of different, in, in essentially all three languages. So you get these very interesting language composition um, across different communities within the, the, the relevant network. And what Graham is gonna talk about is that this, ling this ling linguistic component is really important because you get different information from different languages when it comes to what's in the actual tweets. Um, okay, so, so I showed you the communities and, and what I have here are the actual Twitter handles. So if you look on the left here, this is community one. And these are the top 20 accounts that are doing the most tweeting in that sub-community of our broader network. And there's nothing surprising here, I don't think. These are really, really big name accounts. They're closely associated with governments, i.e. the largest one is the Ukrainian government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, you know, the, the leadership of the country. And you go farther down here and you get into, you know, up here is the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. This is, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing terribly surprising here. This is also part of why we get an awful lot of language, English language tweeting in this particular community. If we go to community two, this one that has a much more sort of equitable distribution across the languages, this is, you know, if you were to go look at these things, which I was doing this morning, you get a, so the, the top one is Radio Free Europe. And this is a lot of relatively independent press. A lot of it has a fairly international footprint and a lot of it is consumed pretty broadly beyond the confines of Ukraine. And, and you know, you can, you can decompose these different communities and they become super duper interesting. Um, so one of the things, oopsie, the way that, you know, the way that people spread the word is they embed other people's tweets. This just shows you the top, uh, embedded accounts. And again, there's nothing too surprising here, right? We have the President of the United States. We have the essentially the, the, the account of the government of Ukraine over here. The interesting thing is you can also do this with Russian disinformation embeds. So we can look at the top and we, we can separately identify communities which are basically right wing. And the right wing communities are really interesting. They're, they're sort of connected to um, some sort of Russian disinformation accounts. The far right 
in, um, in Europe and neo-Nazis in the US. And we can see where what are the most embedded accounts, i.e. what are the sources of this information in those particular communities? And if we have time later, we can talk about a specific example of when we saw a piece of disinformation that that almost made it out of this sort of this sort of sub network of far right um, news and almost spread to the rest of the world. Um, anyway, this is going to allow us to to follow Russian disinformation if we if we have the time. <laughs> so we have all these sub communities. This again is community one, which I showed you before. This is a network graph of all of the communities that come out of our core 400 accounts that then turn into 3,100 and whatever Twitter handles. And this is what the this is what the entire community looks like in terms of uh, the sort of network structure. You can see this is this is pretty dense. There's a fair bit of overlap across these communities. Um, not too surprising. These are these are mostly pro-Ukrainian um, communities. So another question is: We have all this data. We've taken essentially. Let's say we have 5 million tweets a day. Our, our, our attempt to identify the relevant amount of data turns that 5 million accounts into maybe a million and a half or maybe 2 million, depends on the day. Okay, now, now that's still an awful lot of data and we wanna classify that. What, what is in the, the, these tweets? So we have four event categories that, that we're classifying, um, human rights abuses, civilian resistance, displaced peoples, and humanitarian needs. How to do this? Um, there are better ways, if you have time, there are better ways to do this. We didn't have time and we don't have time, so we haven't done better. Um, but one of the things we could talk about is how you might do this better. We do this in a very old school way, which is basically we develop a whole bunch of keywords. These are basically search terms across the three languages and we're looking for matches to these keywords um, <clears throat> this is an example where we have the english set of keywords here ukrainian and russian and basically this is a very very this is you know this is just a bunch of rows of text and we are matching on that text in order to classify the actual text of the tweet of each tweet um, okay, so we're, we're just doing a keyword search and that's about the extent of it. Um, now, a, a question that has been, that I, I worked on a fair amount and has been surprisingly hard is how then to determine where these events are happening. So Twitter will give you the location of a person sometimes, but the location is typically where they open the accounts, not where they happen to be tweeting from in that moment. And it's not clear that you actually care so much about where someone is on the planet, so much as what's being referred to in the tweet, i.e. if it's referring to an event that happened someplace else, you want to know what that someplace else is. So we're searching the actual language of the tweets for a match um, to a list of about 30,000 names of towns and cities. Now, the trick is, you know, Graham can talk about this better than I can, since I don't know anything at all about, about the languages here. But place names have different names in Ukrainian and Russian, but also what's being referred to, i.e. if you refer to the airports in Russian or Ukrainian, the, 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 the name of the place, right, the Kiev airports, Kiev will change. And so this, this makes it quite a nightmare in terms of matching places in the, in the tweets onto a list of places. That list of places is geolocated, right? So we have uh, the X, Y coordinates of each of these towns and cities in the entire country. Now we had some we had some concern about you know if we're really really close to real time we don't want to be providing information that's too granular that someone might use in a in a in a not so nice way. So the question is what's the appropriate level of resolution? We end up taking these lats and longs and we we sort of spatially merge them into rayon uh, boundaries. So you know what we show on the website is basically the incidence or the change in the incidence of these different kinds of events at the level of the rayon. This then is what you get, and I'll let Graham talk a little bit about what we're what we're looking at here. Great, thank you. Um, so what we're outputting basically, you know, in a three hourly intervals is data um, in two forms. One is one is graphs and one is maps. Um, and the graphs, so this is this is human rights abuses, um, and, and we're focusing here on the period between the 15th of April and the 29th of April. 
um, just as because it's what we've compiled uh, most recently. And, and what you see is you uh, that that you know, up to you know, uh, thirty percent of the tweets are um, picking up on keywords that relate to human rights abuses from our keyword list. So it's 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 a lot. We see very frequent uh, instances of, of of people talking about human rights abuses, and then. On the right, you see the map where we geo geolocate each of these tweets, and the size of the circles represents the the number of uh, of tweets from that from that place that from that from that uh, rayon that 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 uh, refers to to human rights abuses. And what you'll see actually in this particular two week uh, window is that when one of the things is that you see that the data really does line up with with what we our broader understanding of facts on the ground. You see lots of uh, the human rights abuses in the in the east, where where, where m most of the fighting is occurring in this period in Kharkiv, Donetsk Oblast, Luhansk Oblast. Uh, you see it down in the south in Kherson. Uh, uh, lots of fighting and shelling, and so this this sort of you know is a is kind of a, a first cut of uh, uh, of understanding the relationship between what we're picking up in the data and what we're picking up and, and, and what that what the reality on the ground is. Another thing that you can do is you can look at some of these spikes uh, in the data. This human rights abuses one is, 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 is tough because there's lots of spikes. But we focus, for example, if you look at there's a big spike on April the 24th. Um, and there we you, you can then dig into the tweets um, and, and read about you know, the forced mobilization of young people and doctors uh, in Kharkiv, Kherson, and, and Zaporizhia, uh, human rights abuses, torture, uh, kidnappings. Um, all sorts of, you know, I don't need to go through a list of horrors, um, but there, there are plenty of them, and they're and they're really spread all around, uh, around the the the, the, the country. Um, this is one of the the ways you get insight into what's going on on the on the ground. You show me the, the next slide, please, Eric. I'm trying. Right. And so one of the tasks that we've set ourselves is to try and, and say, okay, so we have these maps, right? And we have these graphs. Uh, you know, I just talked a little bit about some of the underlying data, but um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time now talking in, in more detail about some of these things. Uh, and really it's a question of, 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 of trying to take, you know, these two, <laughs> two million tweets uh, a day and then trying to work out what, what's, what do they really represent? What are these big spikes? Uh, represent in, 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 in on the on the ground and sometimes that's really easy to do actually and this is an example here of, of, of civilian resistance um, uh, that was uh, particularly easy to, to, to identify again this is um, in this period uh, from the 15th of, 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 of April through to the end of April um, and we see if you look at the at, at the map you'll see big the bigger circles are, are, are in, in Kherson uh, oblast down there in the south, and then further, sort of just south of on 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 the, the Dnieper in uh, Kropivnitsky Oblast, um, uh, and these are essentially you know if you start digging into the tweets, you very quickly read about uh, clear events on the on the ground that that that, that represent um, you know resistance and and and, and uh, protest against the the, the Russian uh, uh, occupation in particular. Here, this huge spike. Um, really refers to protests in, in Kherson, where there was a, a large uh, car convoy uh, of protesters, of citizens standing up against the plans, the Russian plans for holding an illegal referendum uh, on, on, on secession from, from Ukraine. Um, you also see uh, information on, on protesters being shot at, being tortured, uh, being in, imprisoned. Um, and you, it's because of the salience of this particular uh, event that becomes incredibly easy to 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 work out what's what's going on in the on the ground. Um, next slide, please. But it's not always that easy. So if we look at our category of humanitarian support and humanitarian needs, this is kind of a mixed category that of of uh, uh, appeals for support and and also announcements of support. Um, and you look at the same period, we have a number of spikes uh, in, the, in the data and we have events that are spread all across uh, Ukraine, according to the, to the map. And if you sit down to read your, you know, the, 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 the hundreds of thousands of, of tweets that underlie this graph, um, it's not immediately obvious what, what's, you know, what's driving the particular spikes. It seems like there's, there's no one kind of, you know, 
Ruhr mega event that's uh, that's really caught on, and, and and so people are you know when it's large numbers of smaller events, then it becomes much harder in, in lots of different places. It becomes much harder to say anything kind of definitive or, or authoritative uh, on what's underlying the the numbers. So some so spikes are sometimes easily interpretable and sometimes not, and it's always done by by hand, right? It's done by by uh, by, by manually reading through the, the, the tweets. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, Graham, I just want to add what, yeah. I, what, I, what I put in the chat, which is that when you compare the y-axis here with the y-axis on the previous slide, this, you know, we're talking about um, much less data here. So, you know, a, a much smaller number of tweets can look like a spike. In fact, I mean, they are a spike, but they're off a much smaller baseline. And that's, you know, that, that makes it, these are less big events in some sense than the ones that we see in the human rights abuse event category, which is generating much more data. Okay, now yep. the next slide. Thanks. Um, and actually the human rights abuses one is the one that, that, that consistently, at least in, in what I've been looking like has generated the most data, um, sometimes by, but as, as in that last case, an order of magnitude more than others. So another thing that, 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 that you can, Get a sense of qualitatively from looking at this data is the is the different things that the different languages uh, convey to you. So one of the ways we've been getting at that is looking at the the twenty most retweeted uh, tweets in each language by each of the four categories, um, and then trying to use that to get a handle on sort of what the what what the key information that you can get um, from each one. And so this this slide re represents um, the. English language tweets, um, and what really I think are our three main streams of information that you can get from these, from the, or the three main kinds of tweets that we get in this category. The first is a kind of, uh, I sort of think of this as, 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 as you know, advertising Ukrainian strength, um, in, encouraging uh, uh, strong uh, images of Ukraine and, and images of, of resistance uh, for international consumption. And so the first one is this, you know, hashtag stand with Ukraine, um, uh, it's it's you know pictures of uh, of, of of female fighters uh, signing up in in, in Kiev, um, and 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 you know kind of trying to to rally people around um, these patriotic images. Um, another thing you find a lot of uh, in the English language tweets are events not in Ukraine, um, and so sometimes these are events with you know, I, you externally displaced displaced people. Uh, in Poland or somewhere like that. Other times there are events in, in, in Russia. So this particular tweet at the bottom here from the Moscow Times is about arson attacks uh, on Russian enlist enlistment offices, on, on, on uh, offices throughout Russia where, 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 where soldiers are signing up. Um, and so these kinds of international events related to, uh, to the war, to the invasion, um, appear there very prominently in the English language tweets. Then finally, the other thing you see a lot in the English language tweets are uh, are politicians, international politicians, um, taking stances uh, and expressing their 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 their, their opinions on the on the on the war? And this this is a really common uh, phenomenon that you see. This is um, uh, the one of the Edgar Rinkevich, the, the the Latvian foreign minister, um, is a is a pretty uh, prolific tweeter. The same is true for for most of the Baltic uh, foreign ministers actually, and they're they're widely retweeted in this in in, in English. Um, next one, please, Eric. So, if you so the, so, while the English language tends to be these kind of more sort of uh, uh, international, so not surprisingly, uh, issues. If you're really interested in, in breaking events on the ground, then Ukrainian language tweets are, are a much better source. Uh, for those, they tend to be um, the, uh, very. Uh, Specific, they often have video of, 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 of specific events. These two here um, are, uh, the one on the left is, is, is sort of a, a human rights uh, 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 violations in, 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 in um, uh, Kherson Oblast where uh, Rus Russian soldiers are stealing uh, uh, food and, 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 and uh, uh, agricultural products and, 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 and taking away and, and, and selling them. Um, the one on the on the on the right hand side um, is a is a really interesting example of this. This is a, a video of the of that uh, auto convoy, the, the column that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, coming out of Kherson um, in protest against the, the proposed referendum. The tweeter here is actually very 
he's pretty widely retweeted. Um, he goes by Stirlitz 53, which is a really interesting uh, uh, handle um, for a Ukrainian uh, tweeter. Um, he presents himself as a as a as a, uh, as a as a Ukrainian soldier. But if you look at the quality and the frequency of his tweeting, which is very high and very very frequent, um, it seems to be an account that's really probably you know handled by by some official instance um, in, with within Ukraine. But nonetheless, is really really you know consu maybe consequently rather than nonetheless. Um, has a pretty good eye on what's happening on the ground and is, is, is a quick source of reporting uh, on events much faster than, than waiting for the, for the news. Next, please. And then finally, the, the Russian language tweets uh, are super interesting uh, too. There's, there's, there's uh, sort of th th three different ones here that, that I wanted to show you just to give you some sense. Again, these are you know, three out of, out of hundreds of thousands, right? So, um, you know, I don't, I don't claim any representativeness for them other than, you know, they seem representative in a qualitative way from, from reading a lot of these things. Um, but they, they, they re these represent sort of, uh, the two on the left represent uh, what's pretty common in the, uh, in the Russian language sphere, which are um, references to or discussions of events in uh, Eastern Ukraine, um, which is where you would expect uh, Russian speakers to be tweeting from, um, and that's kind of was my, my my first my first thought. These are Russian speakers, but there's a couple of things that are interesting about these tweets that that I think that reflect the broader community. One is that the Russian tweets are often related to events which are pretty old. Uh, by you know by old I mean like a few days ago or or even up to a week ago, um, and so they don't seem to be they're not real time in the same sense that the Ukrainian ones are often real time. And then if you look at the accounts uh, of these people. Um, who are tweeting in, in, in Russian, what you find is that they also tweet a lot in Ukrainian. Um, and often what's happening here, and this is not at all exclusively the case, but often what's the case is these are messages um, that are you know, clearly aimed for a Russian speaking audience. They're, they're, they're clearly set up uh, to draw attention to, to human rights abuses and war crimes and other things in Eastern Ukraine um, and targeted at, uh, at a Russian speaking audience. Um, which I think is really, really interesting. The, the account on the, on the right is, a, um, from what I can tell, uh, is, well, it's, it's, it's not from what I can tell, it's very clear on his uh, account, is a, a Lithuanian uh, 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 anti-Russianist. <laughs> anti he very clearly describes himself as such and, and lots of other, other more colorful terms. Um, this is a, a, a video of an attack on a, a, where an apartment in Kharkiv uh, went on fire. And again, this is the same kind of um, trying to send messages really directly to the to the Russian speaking community. So you get you know, there's huge overlap amongst the tweets, but you get these three different flavors uh, across the three different languages as you as you read across them. So what to do with all of this stuff, right? how to get this stuff out? So one of the things that, that, that we do that Eric talked about, which is the, the website, which has the regular you know, the maps and the, uh, and the and the graphs being updated uh, on a three hourly basis. Um, but we're also trying to work out how to communicate uh, the information in a you know in, in such a way that you don't have to spend your whole life sitting you know staring at your computer checking this thing um, to, to to follow what's going on, um, and that's been challenging because there's so much of it, um, and you know in a, in the space of a week we're generating you know you know many millions of of, of, of tweets um, and trying to analyze them. So so what what, what do we do? Well, we're trying to develop uh, protocols for producing periodic reports. Um, at, given the staff that we have right now, um, which is very thin and overstretched and all supposedly really employed doing other things, um, we're trying to produce bi-weekly reports um, that will focus on the most shared tweets by language and by category. So what I just uh, took you through, that'll look at the most important spikes in the data also by category. Um, and we'll also include the, 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 the most embedded tweets uh, that we think are, are producing disinformation. Um, this is a very labor intensive exercise um, requiring a, a lot of reading of tweets across languages and across the categories. Uh, one of the things that, that doing this labor intensive uh, exercise convinces you of though is that the keywords are doing a really good job uh, of uh, picking up relevant tweets and categorizing them, which is um, you know, someone who's a, a qualitative researcher primarily um, or has done a lot of that. Kind of work. It's it was really reassuring to me to see that what you know when you read into these mountains 
um, you're finding what you're hoping to find, um, which I thought was really is really great. So we're working on that. Uh, we will be uploading the periodic reports to the website, um, uh, and and you can follow them there. Uh, next one. So it's you, Eric. Now you're gonna have to put your microphone on. Okay. So now, now actually, I think we mostly want to ask for some help from you all because Graham has talked about the weekly reports, but I think you know we have some we have some hopes for how this data might be used, how we might use it, but we'd also be happy to hear from all of you uh, for ideas about what you think we might do. We have a couple of different ideas in mind. One is, you know, one cluster of issues bear on, on sort of the policy world and what's actually happening. So one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that I would say on average, and again, this is an average of a bunch of deep dives, not an average across a systematic analysis of the relationship between what we're doing and what the news is doing. But I would say on average, we're beating the news by about six hours on major events. And so the question for policymakers is, is that enough to actually really be useful? So one way in which we thought this might be useful is if you, you know, if you learn of a bombing and you're at the Polish border, six hours might really make a big difference if you think you're going to see a big wave of refugees. You know, so staffing and the and um, sort of relief uh, materials might be might be able to arrive earlier than they would otherwise, and that that might be of some help. Um, it you know I have no idea. I don't I I don't know the humanitarian business well enough, but obviously there's scarce resources that are being that are being directed to very specific places, and it could be that a six or seven hour lead on some kinds of events. Would be enough to help steer that humanitarian relief in a slightly more um, in a slightly more sort of efficient and useful way. A third way, I mean, this is not about short-term responses, but clearly the ICC is is investigating war crimes, and in some you know, so what we presented here was depending on the graph that you were looking at, it was either a day or it was two weeks or whatever. We can also generate a timeline of the entire of the entire war. And that could be useful to um, investigators who otherwise might have to do just an awful lot of reading of the news, right? So we'll be able to look at, you know, where are the big spikes in human rights abuses over the course of the entire conflict. This then allows investigators to maybe more efficiently do their investigations. Um, you know, whether or not this is useful for decision makers and planners is, you know, I, I'm curious to, to hear. Um, some of us have presented this in different ways to different policy audiences. And I guess, at least in my personal experience, that's mostly been about curiosity rather than action. So they think it's cool, they think it's neat, but <clears throat> but the from here to doing something with it is a is I I haven't heard that yet. So maybe Graham has heard something different in his presentations. We are researchers, and you know we didn't start this with any intent of really doing research. We just started this with the intent of hopefully trying to do something useful up upon the planet. I do think that there's an awful lot of research that could happen here. One of the things, and I'll just talk about this quickly. Um, so we had a we had a set of tweets bearing on the use of chemical weapons by Russia in Maripol. Maybe what was this, Graham? Maybe three weeks ago. And this started to sort of percolate out into the universe. And there were, you know, sort of the big international press was starting to say there are unconfirmed reports. This ultimately is squashed and disappears. But we were able to sort of decompose the origin of this back to the original tweet. And so this, this has allowed us to sort of, this has allowed a glimpse into sort of the disinformation system that um, that clearly can be used for very strategic purposes. So we know from, for instance, from the Syrian war that Russia, that some sort of Russian source would oftentimes leak some sort of false information, which the Russian government would then um, deny and say, look, this is this is evidence that you know foreign powers have malicious intent towards Russia. This is all this is all bullshit. Um, and but this would then be a precursor to Russia actually doing the really naughty thing, and the really naughty thing would then be treated as yet another piece of disinformation, just like the last one that we disproved. So, so this, you know, we we have a we have a pattern of previous behavior, and we have a source of information that clearly in the past Russia has used strategically to um, to sort of prepare the ground for future um, misbehavior. The question is, could we 
could we use this data to to see it if and how that's working now it, you know to me this would be super interesting um because we know because we know what the high quality twitter handles are we can actually gather their entire history that they've ever been on twitter and this is going to allow us to look at some point at how these kinds of information networks evolve i.e pre-war we have a bunch of um, Ukrainian government accounts and Ukrainian politicians and Ukrainian news sources that are connected to the world in assorted ways. That all changes very significantly uh, over the course of the war. And you know, a related issue is we can see that some, you know, one use for Twitter is you want people to retweet it, to be retweeting your accounts. We can see that we have these sort of Ukrainian accounts that are connected to the outside world. Some some tweets get a lot of traction and are quickly spread around the world and some of them do not so understanding sort of you know as a strategic matter what is the kind of information and the kind of framing that an international community likes that that um that then generates a lot of attention is also i think something that would be worth researching and then as as uh as i just mentioned i think what we have here is an archive that that folks not not just the at the uh, the international criminal court might use but also that scholars might use to investigate you know all the, the these the kinds of things that are happening on the ground um and again i would just say that we could really use some help here um we, we mostly have spent our time trying to make this all work and not a lot of intellectual effort has gone into like what you know how we might use it so if you have any ideas on this front that would be great in conclusion i just want to draw on a couple of lessons and i'm, I'm coming here as someone who's who, you know who has interest in lots of different places and who really, really suffered through the creation of this, of this uh, sort of real time machine. And for me, the, the, some of the lessons that I reflect on are sort of what, what, what if this happens again in the world? Um, and, and we've learned some really important things. The first is that Twitter is great for this kind of thing. And you don't, the fact that there is not a ton of Twitter use in Ukraine relative to other social media sources is not actually a problem, um, depending on what you want to do. If you just want to get at the kinds of events that we're looking at, I don't, it, it's not really, it doesn't really seem to be a problem that everyone is not on Twitter. You don't need everyone to be on Twitter. Um, and now that we know how to do this, the next time that there is a war somewhere, we could set up this kind of a thing, I think in, in two or three days rather than in a couple of weeks. But if you're going to do this kind of thing, holy moly, like basically my entire computing life came to an end for a while because it's just like you just need a lot of <laughs> you just need a lot of place to put all this data never mind processing all of it um so the the keyword approach that we have here as graham mentioned is really nice that it that has been working um there are lots of natural language processing models these days that are way better and some of those models exist in russian and english and ukrainian and we could use them if we had a lot of time, the trick is the people that are doing the natural language processing don't know Russian and don't know Ukrainian, so we couldn't have assessed performance, even if we could deploy the the, the better models themselves. Um, you know, the the other way to do this would have been to take all those tweets and translate them into English and use fancy NLP tools on the English translated tweets, but that is really computational intensive too. And since we we wanted to get this, you know, we want to report hourly data in as close to real time as possible. That that ended up not working either. Um, mapping was really hard. I don't, I don't know if there's if there's someone that's interested in mapping out there. I'm happy to talk more about this. But if you if you deal in uh, base maps anywhere in the world, you've realized that lat longs and place names and everything is a chaotic mess, no matter how good you think your source is. And in this case, we found a lot. <laughs> we found a lot of messes um, and are actually still finding some messes, I would say. I will say is the you know Ernesto and I is, is sort of the the data people on this project you know there's just zero chance of doing the big data making big data useful without without people who know what on earth you're looking for or looking at um and from beginning to end this project I would say has has been absolutely undoable without um you know these core titter, these these core twitter handles the keywords, the interpretation of, of what these spikes mean, the debugging of the output. This is just like, we could never do that um, without, without the country experts. And then this is really, I think what Graham, where Graham sort of left off, which is even still, you know, moving from all of this data to something more interpretive 
is a very, very heavy lift. So you take this, you take all this data and you turn in these nice graphs and these nice maps. And, and then you try to really understand what the graphs and the, and the maps mean. And there's just no avoiding the fact that the human brain has to get involved. And that's, that's a tough thing. And getting the human brain involved in a way that is relevant to what is happening in the world and that might actually make a difference is a, is a, is a really significant challenge. So the technology in some ways is easy. It's only interpretable if you have country experts, and then you still face the challenge of making it relevant and interpreting all of this. Um, so, so lots of lessons, many of them positive, some of them not surprising, um, but I'm, I'm happy to hear what any of you have to say. I mean, I think we're, we're very much in, in a mode of listening and getting ideas. And with that, I will stop and just say thank you. Thank you very much, Graham and Eric. Um, if you can leave the slide up or you can also sort of close the shared screen again. Perfect, thank you. Um, maybe I can use my position to sort of clarify a few things about how you did it and um, others feel free to write into the chat any, any questions, comments, or also advice on how to, how to use um, this amazing source of, of data. But um, maybe going back to the to the beginning, I'm I'm wondering if you could explain a bit more how these core uh, Twitter handles were identified, and maybe I missed it. But um, uh, kind of, do you keep adding to them as well? I mean, some might also drop off, some some might might join. Um, so maybe you can can say a little bit more about that. And then I was also really intrigued by what you showed briefly about the, the different um, communities, as, as you called them, and then you looked at the language um, sort of distribution. Um, but uh, what, what um, sort of is this? This is entirely based on who shares information or tweets with, with whom, and um, are there other characteristics um, to these communities um, that you maybe haven't talked about? And maybe that's also could be another part of the content that one then wants to to lift or, or look at, although the language is already, I think, in itself very, very interesting. But what other factors sort of distinguish these, these communities as far as you can, can make out from the, from the data, I think would be um, really interesting um, to know. And um, Eric, you just addressed that already. I was sort of mostly also wondering about changes over time, maybe with regard to the various categories of things you look for, but displacement or humanitarian issues um, um, and, and human rights abuses and so on. But I don't know if there's other things you want to want to add to that, but maybe maybe I stop here for the moment and um, wait for other questions and comments, but maybe you can pick up some of these points already. Graham, do you want to talk about the core accounts and then I'll talk about some of the some of the dynamic stuff? Sure, absolutely. So the, the, the core accounts was, was done in a really, a really qualitative way. Um, and it was primarily done um, by Ola's team at, at, at Manchester in identifying essentially who the authoritative voices in Ukraine were likely to be and then, and then capturing those accounts and everyone who, who, who follows them. And we sort of, we did it at, at the different levels. We did it at the kind of national uh, level who in terms of government, media and political parties um, and then we also did local uh, media and, and local politicians. And you know, my one of my grad students, Sylvia Nitsova, who spent a lot of time in Eastern Ukraine, uh, was was a, a major player in in that. And so we tried to capture both kind of prominent voices at the local level and at the at the higher level. The result is that um, we have a set of voices, a set of um, uh, accounts that. They're are probably more official and more professional than, than one might expect, right? Um, and so when you read in the tweets, it's really it, many, many, many of the, of the more prominent tweets are from people who are journalists um, uh, or, you know, politicians or, or somehow tweeting in more or less in a professional capacity. Um, that, I think, has its advantages and disadvantages. I think it's a pretty good advantage advantage in terms of you know getting information about events on the ground in real time um, and we see that very much in the in the Ukrainian language tweets um, but it does mean that you have to sort of interpret the the, 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 the individuals in a, in a particular way right they are mostly um, tweeting in a professional capacity and so that's a slightly different crew uh, than you might otherwise get in terms of the categories themselves so, you know the, the the human rights abuses and the civil resistance, those were derived from um, categories that we thought were just were, were, were substantively interesting 
um, and also connected to uh, political science literature. Um, so a number of people on the project, all on myself, are, are very essentially protest people, right? And so we were very interested in, in civil resistance and trying to understand patterns of, of, of that. And so that was really a combination of what we were personally interested in and, and, and thought would be important uh, in this context. And so it's partly substantively driven and partly uh, you know, driven by, by, by poli-sci theory. Yeah, so let me talk about how we how we identify these sub networks, these sort of these communities within the broader network, and that that's purely inductive. Um, we're basically, I mean, we're using a community detection algorithm to to sort of parse who is who is communicating most densely uh, with whom, and and that's how that is defined. It it is the case that that could change through time. We have we have done this a couple of different times and have found these sub communities to be quite stable um so that is that is in fact not moving around all that much what distinguishes the communities is really interesting so if you go farther so what i was showing you is the really was the biggest ones the ones that have the most communication with a lot of sort of um dense transmission of of tweeting as you go to let's say the 10th or the 12th or the 15th you get much more specialized communities so you might get a community that is very focused on sort of the military tactics and strategies and whatever. It's a it's a it's a smaller community. It's a much more specialized community, and the information that they're that they're communicating is is quite different. Um, but they're stable for the most part. The dynamic part is 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 more what Graham was talking about with regards to keywords, where we have over the course of the conflict added keywords as dynamics on the ground have changed. And as that has happened, we have added keywords really as they appear in 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 Twitter. You know, so for instance, as it became as the Russians were withdrawing, um, and the and the reports on the on the horrible human rights abuses were coming out, this introduced a set of issues and and terms and language um, that were new. So we just we just add them to the keyword list and and we continue processing. So that's where the that's where the dynamics are, are coming from, um, not so much from the communities themselves. Which I think is a really interesting finding, not if one thinks about it in, in research terms. No? Um, yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned others that that you may want to pursue, but one could imagine or it's an open question. What happens no, if that even stays stable in a way in the most extreme circumstances? Um, when you could imagine information starting to or people wanting to to make it um, flow in different different ways um i think that is um kind of in, in academic terms at least i think that's that's a that's a really interesting finding yeah eric and i were wondering so sorry so no, eric and i were wondering about that this morning just whether it's a whether what we're that stability is a product of the way we selected the core accounts mm um and their kind of sort of semi-official status or professional status or whether or whether it's that's just the way it is right it's not to say that they're it's not to say that they don't connect to each other in different ways depending on what's going on so this is like you're this is like taking all of that data and and uh extracting out um different sort of sub communities at any given point in time these communities are connected to each other and connected to the rest of the world so in some sense, the, the most interesting dynamic stuff is when when they're not just communicating with each other, right? When there's when when there is something going on, and I assume folks know Twitter well enough to know how to get out of their own bubble when they want to get out of their own bubble. And this is why that that example of the supposed Russian use of chemical weapons in Maripol was so interesting to me because it was clear that they did not want this to get out of the bubble. They would have they would have. I assume they know how to do this at this point. So this is sort of it's sort of looking at the boundaries of the communities and the stuff that that gets out of them that is in some ways the most interesting from a strategic point of view. Absolutely. Um, personally, I have more questions, um, but uh, let's give others the chance too. I don't see anything in the chat now, but I can only sort of encourage um, people as they're digesting, I suppose, the enormity of this project um, to. To kind of think of some questions or ask um, or comment on on some of the things you said um but while that's still going on um 
I, I mean, on this point of disinformation, I was also wondering, you, you just started explaining it a bit, um, but how do you, I mean, how do you detect it? I mean, that seems to be one maybe then so suspicious um, way of behaving if you want to keep information in a certain certain bubble. Um, how else can, can you or can the system detect what is um, what you could then confidently label this is disinformation and this is this is something else given uh, that there's obviously a lot of information traveling in all kinds of directions at the moment and um, how 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 does the system do that and how can you be confident about it yeah so the the easiest way to do this that we have found so far is you can in in these 200 million tweets plus that we have you can generate a list of the of the most embedded websites and the way that you know the way that disinformation you need people to read your disinformation for it to work and you know if you look at that list of let's say the top 50 the top 50 embedded uh sites you get a lot of mainstream stuff but you also get a lot of stuff that does not look mainstream at all and you know I, for me it takes a while to sort of figure out what's what for someone with substantive knowledge of of the region i think it's pretty quick work to figure out okay this is a weird editor or this is a journal you know it, it doesn't take too long in many cases to figure out what's fake news and once you know what the fake news, you know, that, that's that's a very strong signal. Something that is being retweeted an awful lot that is clearly fake news is, you know, how that evolves and how that's used strategically is a is a much more complicated thing than what we've been able to do so far. But is it on the basis of your data? Is it or would it be possible to I mean, once one kind of understands also these community or network um, dynamics a bit? Uh, is it possible to to get at the at the strategy different strategies of of disinformation? I mean, one could be to yes, I mean, make information sort of close information in, but another typical strategy is that you spread so many different things that nobody knows what's going on, and you can probably think of all kinds of other strategies. Is it is it possible um, to get get to that on the basis of this data? Because that would also show kind of how does disinformation work in 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 war times, or maybe not only in war times. No, or does it mm -hmm. does it follow similar patterns to non-war times? I think I mean it's very easy to see the disinformation farms of which they're they definitely exist. These they're just churning out junk. They're they're churning out fake news. They're very easy to identify. The question of when and how disinformation spreads beyond sort of the core you know, target for that disinformation, that's the, that we can definitely see that because we can see which, you know, this, this example of the use of chemical weapons, it almost made it because it was starting to be picked up by some slightly more, I wouldn't say mainstream, um, smaller uh, independent media sites across the region that are also weakly connected to some bigger media sites and to more formal so for instance someone in the u.s government some guy who works at the department of defense ended up retweeting this thing about uh the russian use of chemical weapons so this is a you know we can see these things whether or not one is whether or not there's enough there there whether or not there's an actual strategy involved in the use of disinformation beyond just making the world confusing but actually trying to strategically get particular pieces of disinformation out into the world, that's that's very interesting and not that's something we could look for. And I'm just, we don't know if it's there yet. Yeah. What I found really interesting in that Mariupol example as well was one of the strategies was to take, so at a certain point, this was circulating in some really, really far right, um, really nasty uh, neo-Nazi uh, accounts. And then more kind of mainstream journalists would pick it up and they would tweet it as though it was a, their original tweet. So they, would, they, they, they wouldn't retweet the site that has the terrible reputation, but they would, they would basically just retweet it as though it was their thing. And so that when people saw it, they wouldn't see, oh, well, of course, this comes from these lunatics, right? This comes from somebody who is you know, more mainstream. And so that's kind of how, the, how it was laundered, really, I think is, the, you know, I don't know if that's the term that people use, but it, for me, that was just incredibly interesting to see uh, those different strategies and, and you know in principle we could definitely you know with enough time follow a lot of these these these, these stories and rumors. Thank you very much. I'm surprised there's still no <laughs> no other questions or, or comments coming in. Um, 
but maybe on that point that you you mentioned sort of what what difference can six hours make no um you, you could think that in 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 a war that that's that's a significant amount of time if you can be six hours uh, ahead of, of other news. Um, I mean, are you trying? I mean, I know you've, you've got sort of the website and, and, and we can also post the link again, um, but is this connected or are you connecting it to um, uh, humanitarian aid organizations, local um, initiatives along the routes of, of displacement and, and, and so on? I mean, that seems, uh, I don't know if that's possible with the team you have or if some, some other effort is needed to get that information to um, kind of those types of organizations. So getting the, something like this to have traction in the, you know, in the, the quote unquote real world um, uh, requires connections um, because you need to get important people interested in it. And you, you need to get it in front of important people who can then you know, open doors uh, and, 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 and work from there. And you know, Ola Onuch is amazingly uh, amazing in many, many ways. But one of one of the th amazing things about Ola is her connections uh, to you know influential people both in the in the UK uh, and uh, in Ukraine. Um, and so she has partnered with uh, with a British Labour Party MP uh, who is particularly interested in, in 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 the human rights aspects of the of the war and, and the displaced persons aspects of the war. And so he presented. Uh, on the project to um, to the the the, uh, the UN human rights uh, sorry the human the UN refugees organization uh, in Geneva and to a couple of other Geneva based UN uh, organizations that are active on the ground. Um, also uh, has this is also in front of um, uh, people in the in the in the in the presidential administration uh, in Kiev. Um, through through some of Ola's contacts there, what they're doing with any of this stuff we don't know. Um, you know, obviously in Kiev it, that's a whole other uh, ball game where you know secrecy and and, and uh, uh, you know, opacity is necessary at this point in the war. Um, you know, I don't I don't know of of how it was picked up in in, in Geneva, but those are certainly you know we're not. Uh, in the in the in the humanitarian assistance game at all um but it does seem to us like like you know having this time advantage and we've seen it on a number of different occasions would be is is at least potentially a value absolutely and also to the ongoing fact-finding missions no they they um in terms of um documenting or collecting evidence on um war crimes so that seems um the obvious place that they need need to have access to it as well so the big advantage with respect to that, I think, is you know we have these you know very high profile uh, incidents of of of, of war crimes uh, in somewhere like Bucha, but really there are war crimes going on all over Ukraine, um, in different kinds of war crimes in different places, um, depending on the on the context and and what this data will offer is you know once the you know the 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 the, the criminal court. Uh, gets their lawyers and researchers on it. This this really is an amazing set of opportunities to to identify where should we be looking, because right now it sort of seems like you on a daily basis you kind of sort of feel like you know where to look, uh, because of what you're reading in the media. Well, a not really because there's much more going on, uh, and then b add in time, add in you know a few years from now, um, when you know our experience in, in in the former Yugoslavia suggests that you know international cr criminal tribunals move incredibly slowly. Uh, and so with that distance, that's going to be really hard. And what this archive will have, will have them uh, the opportunity to, to, to sort of re-experience the real-time uh, data and, and, and follow it up uh, in a way that I think is probably you know, not available in any other source or at least any other single place. And so I think that, you know, that may, you know, in the long run be the, be the biggest contribution of this. I don't know. Absolutely. So I think that's um, it's, it's definitely I think the biggest project of its kind to document in, in all over the country what is what is happening. No? So that, um, that that will be and remains an incredible source um, for light later on as well. Um, I don't see I don't know if um, my chat isn't working properly. Um, I, <laughs> I do not see any any questions at the moment, but I also I get a sense that um, and I feel a little bit sort of the same way, although I've heard you present on it beforehand and now I I could formulate or begin to formulate a few questions. 
I think it's quite overwhelming. And uh, I think one has to process, first of all, what it is you are doing and then what that data is. Um, but maybe also by um, posting um, the recording on our website and we'll also pass it on to um, kind of different different places, if, if you like, um, different organizations, also in um, sort of German maybe government and, and sort of the charity sector as well. Um, maybe maybe that um, is one, one small step towards um, um, making it even more known than it is already. Um, but I, yeah. I'd like to use the, the link in the, so my chat is working, the link um, in the chat um, to the project. Um, who wants, whoever wants to find out more, you can, you can look at the data there. Also um, get in touch with a team responsible. And um, I can only at this point, if there are no other questions or comments, I can only thank you again that you've you presented it here and uh, I, I am in awe of what you've done in, in such short time and that this is possible and humanly possible. Um, so thank you so much for, for presenting it here and um, I'm sure we'll be in touch also about this project. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. Thank you. It's great to see you all.